much to bring together, and there are so many ways that we could cap this experience. So believe me when I say it is truly a huge pleasure for my final introduction of the program to connect you with one of the very best sense makers and storytellers I've ever encountered. Someone with a truly unique perspective on the conversations that we've had over two fascinating days together. This is David Roberts. He's regarded as one of the world's top experts on disruptive innovation and exponentially advancing technology. And his passion is to help transform the lives of a billion people in the world through disruptive innovation. And he has a fascinating range of experience. He started his career as a military special agent and was a decorated officer and leader in the executive branch of the US government. Currently, He's the chairman of OneCubit, the world's leading software company for quantum computers. And he's also the founder of an organization called Exponential Leadership that's dedicated to transforming leadership potential through character, integrity, compassion, courage, and happiness. And now, for a final session where we'll explore the keys to innovation and unlocking agency and activation at multiple levels, please give a very warm welcome to the one and only David Roberts. How's everybody doing? Energy for one more? So I got a, I got an hour and a half <laughs> and a hundred and twenty slides or something. <laughs> um, I want to give some thanks at least to uh, Coach Shannon and to Lloyd for the work that they do to create this, these, these events in addition to our sponsors SCB, these events get created usually because just one or two people really want them to happen and then they engage other people that engage other people and, and that produces something and, and, and they're extraordinary leaders in Thailand, and, and I really want to give them some sincere thanks for that. I wanted to talk about some principles. Um, but to do it, I, I want to go back to a, a time in high school in my life where I was, um, not, not that I'm any more mature, but I was definitely much less mature then. And, in, in high school, I had a little bit of an innovative bend, and some of it was because my parents were fairly lenient about experimenting. And so one of my desires was, was to have a chemistry kit. And what's interesting about this now is that they don't make chemistry kits for kids anymore. But this was a long time ago when they did, and so I wanted a chemistry kit, and I, I'd been communicating that to my parents. And my parents uh, very foolishly went ahead and got me one. And so when you're sort of 15, 16 years old, and you're growing up in the cornfields of Ohio, you're really bored. And so you're looking for exciting things to do. And so one of the other things that I had was an encyclopedia. And for those of you that don't know what that is, <laughs> um, before the days of Wikipedia, we sort of just printed out the whole Wikipedia. And yeah, you would imagine that would be big, and it was. It was like 26 volumes big. But you could look things up, like Wikipedia. You just didn't do it with a search. It was done alphabetically. And so you pull out a book, and I, I did that, and I found, I looked up, explosive reactions because that's what I was wanting to do maybe with the chemistry set and sure enough as I was scanning through it I was looking for an explosive reaction that I could do with the chemistry set that, and the chemicals that I actually had and so sure enough I found one and hopefully there's no youth or kids in the audience but if, it turns out that if you mix potassium permanganate with glycerin, you can get a violent reaction. And I see some chemists nodding their head because they've done this. 
And so I had potassium permanganate in the kit. And my father was a, a physician, and so he had glycerin in the closet. And so I went ahead and I got the glycerin and I got the potassium permanganate and I got this cup. And I added a little bit of the potassium permanganate in the cup and then a little bit of the glycerin and nothing happened. So I added a little more and nothing happened and then I added a little more and nothing happened. And the reason nothing happened is that the reaction is what's called a slow reaction. So it takes a few minutes for the reaction to happen. It has nothing to do with the amount. But I thought it was the amount. And so I, I kept adding to it. And then sure enough, the reaction started. And I was holding this cup, and this fiery red flame just starts shooting out of the cup. And of course, because the cup is made of paper, it burns right through the cup onto the floor. Now, I didn't mention that I was doing this in my bedroom in the house. And so it fell immediately onto the carpet. And I could see that this was going to be really bad. And back at that time, we, we learned this thing in high school that if you ever caught on fire, you were supposed to drop and roll. And, and the drop and roll just meant that you could extinguish it by taking away the air, the oxygen. And I knew that. And somehow at this moment, I had that brilliant idea where I could take the World Book Encyclopedia that was right next to me, and I slammed it down on top of it, and sure enough, poof, the fire was out. Success. Now, of course, I had this hole in the carpet that was like this big, and it was right in the middle of my bedroom. So to solve that problem, the only thing I could think to do was to take one of my dressers that was against the wall and to, and to push it into the middle of the room to hide the hole. And now my parents thought it was strange when they saw the dresser in the middle of my room and I had a story for it. And the story was that it was more convenient, which it was. It was more convenient to have it right in the middle of the room. And they thought it was odd, but it didn't, they didn't really ask any more questions because I actually just did a lot of odd things at that time. <laughs> but it was a success. A success without a failure that anyone could notice. Which meant I could do another. And so this time I got a little smarter and I got this Tupperware book. And I wanted to do something different, but I wasn't sure. I couldn't find another reaction. So the best I could do was get this Tupperware bowl and start adding the chemicals that were in the kit to the bowl, presuming that at least there would be some combination that would create a reaction. And this is a bit why they don't sell chemistry kits to kids, because that's what they do when they get one, is they mix everything in it together, and something's going to react. And so, Sure enough, it started to heat up, and it started to get warm, and I was thinking I might end up with this fiery hole through the plate again, and so what I did is I found this Coke can, and I poured everything in the Tupperware bowl into the Coke can. And so now, it was in a steel container, and I didn't really understand chemistry at the time, and so I thought, because it was getting warmer and warmer, and I thought, well, if I cooled it down, that might slow down or stop the reaction. And so I went and I put the Coke can into the fridge in the kitchen. Now, when you're 14 or 15, it, it turns out that your attention span is not as long as it is when you're an adult. And so I sat there and I watched the fridge for about 10 minutes, which feels like a week to a 15-year-old. And so after 10 minutes was over, I went downstairs and just started playing ping pong with my sister. And then sure enough, I went to bed that night and I didn't think anything again of the Coke can in the fridge with the chemical reaction. I went to school the next day. And while I was in school, 
I got called to the principal's office. And I'd never been called to the principal's office before. But I was thinking, even when I got called, I wondered if this might have something to do with the Coke can. And when I got to the principal's office, he said, you know, can you sit down for a moment? I just want to let you know that your mother is in the hospital. And I was thinking the worst. And he said, yeah, and so, uh, and so your dad is going to come and he's going to pick you up and, and take you home today. Um, and so sure enough, my dad came and picked me up from school and I'm in the car with him and I'm sitting there still thinking, is, could this be related? And then I knew that it was because while we were in the car driving home, he asked me, he said, um, do you know anything about this cook can in the fridge? And we had, a, we had a wonderfully honest relationship and it was honest because he rarely punished me. I was rarely ever punished. And so I could have this open, candid communication because there was never really a bad result from the honesty. And so I said, yeah, and I explained to him what happened and that I had the Tupperware. I didn't mention, by the way, about the burnt carpet. I, I just mentioned about the Tupperware bowl and that I put it in there to be safe and that I wanted to cool the reaction down. And so he said, well, when your mother came home, she saw the Coke can in the fridge and there was still something in it and took a sip out of the Coke can. And so she burned her lip and, and then she went to the hospital to get treated for it. And so, sure enough, I realized this repercussion of something that I had done. Because I, I hadn't sort of thought it all the way through. But I, I'd somehow hurt my mother which clearly was no intention, but all I was thinking, because when my dad was asking me about this, and then he's like, well, you know, we're going to have this conversation with your mom. When we got home, and I'm thinking, now this isn't going to get good, he starts the conversation with my mother, but he can't even bring up the story because he keeps laughing so hard. And he's laughing because he can't believe that she took a sip out of someone else's coke can. And not to kind of high, because I had the assumption, who takes a sip out of someone else's Coke? And so because of the humor of the incident, there's no punishment. Which means, I can try another experiment. <laughs> So now I'm stuck to the yard, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what can I do in the yard? And, and I had just watched this James Bond movie. It had just come out. And um, in the James Bond movie, there's a moment where they visit Q. Do you remember Q? And he comes up with all the tech stuff that James Bond uses. And one of the things that Q has invented is these, uh, it's called an exploding bola. And I'll actually show you a video of this. But it looks a little bit like this. And, and so it's three balls, and they used to be used in Australia to catch animals. And so you could spin this thing and throw it, and it would spin in the air and wrap around an animal's leg and trip it. So sure enough, I, I figure out how to actually make one of these safely, so without the heavy rocks on the end, but with tennis balls. And let me, let me show you the video that I watched, because this is the video that excited you know, a 15-year-old boy in high school. Ah, there you are, 007. Balls, Q. <laughs> Bonus, 007. Here, 
and I'm back and I'm practicing throwing this bowl and it's cool. You throw it, it wraps around and it spins just like that except it doesn't blow up. So I'm doing this on the lawn and then as I'm doing it once, I'm getting ready to spin it, I can hear my mother's car coming around the corner. And so as I turn to look at the car, I still end up doing the throw. And so the bola doesn't go quite where it's supposed to because I'm distracted. And instead, it goes through the window of the house and takes out the vase in the front of the house. Now my mother, all she sees is me look at her and throw this bola right through the window of the house. And so she thinks, like, I'm mad at her, this is some kind of a vengeance thing. Anyway, I end up having to work the whole summer long to pay for the window and the vase, and I get a little bit of a punishment. But nobody's really injured. Which means, I can still do another experiment. <laughs> and so I get a hold of this James Bond book, and I'm reading through it, but I'm grounded now inside of the house. I can't even leave the house. And so I'm looking through this thing, and I, I come across this thing called a nauseous gas, how to make a nauseous gas. And I'm 15, so I don't really know what the word nauseous means. Um, but it means kind of like a big, poisonous, uh, really disturbing gas. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't leave the house, but I could do this in the garage. And it turns out, if you mix aluminum foil with muriatic acid, pool acid, you can create a nauseous gas. So here I am, I'm in the safety of the garage, and it says you should get a gas mask for this, and I happen to have a gas mask from an Army Navy store. So I got the gas mask next to me, it's a very safe environment, I got a little bucket, I take some aluminum foil and I pour in some acid, nothing happens, because it's a slow reaction, and you think that I would have learned about slow reactions. But I didn't, because I didn't understand it was slow before. And so I added another aluminum foil, some more acid, aluminum foil, and sure enough, the reaction starts. And it's a huge, billowing cloud. I mean, it's so big that it starts to pile up on the roof, and starts to lower down. And just then, the garage door starts to open because my mom is coming home. <laughs> and so she pulls into the garage. And the only thing I can think to do is to stop her from getting out of the car. So I run up to the car and I hold her door closed and I'm yelling at her, don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car. But of course I've got this gas mask on, so all she sees is me going, oh, like this. So she's struggling to get out of the car and I'm trying to hold her in and there's a tone that your mother maybe could use with you, which my mother could, especially when she said my full name with the middle names too. And she said that and like, let me out of the car. And I just did what she said and she got out and took a whiff of this and then she ends up on the floor. So now the situation is serious. And I'm thinking to myself, the only thing I could think to do is to help her and to get her out of the garage. So I grab both of her ankles and start to pull her gently out of the garage. And of course, as I'm doing this, my parents usually come home at the same time, and so my dad pulled into the driveway and sees me pulling his wife out of the garage by the ankles. Needless to say, this didn't end well for me. And, and there was a relatively severe punishment that happened then, and, and I didn't do any more experiments after that. And you're probably wondering now, what the heck does this have to do with innovation or anything else? But I want, to, I want to walk you through what I learned in it. Because each of these things, they, they taught me something, and I didn't realize it at the time. But they did, because they learn lessons. When you fail, you learn the lessons. Even if you succeed, you learn the lessons. And so, you know, the first one I realized, and I realized these are the same failings that are in manufacturing. 
Because they're, they're just the same feelings for anything. But I realized not thinking things through. Because I knew there was the paper cup, but I didn't think it through. Like what happened if I got the violent reaction? It would burn through and burn the carpet. And then there's number two, which I actually think is the reason that all startups fail, by the way. And now I'm even convinced that all businesses don't succeed for this reason. And it's over and underestimating something. Your business will not do well because your leadership team will over or underestimate something. And that's why it's actually so helpful to have a board or to have advisors because they will help you to not under or overestimate something. And so when you under and overestimate things, these assumptions have long, serious effects later on, but they feel small, but the assumptions matter, and they matter what we call asymmetrically, meaning it feels small in the beginning, the assumption you make, but later on, you get this huge repercussion. And so, having my mother sent to the hospital as a repercussion of just having the assumption that nobody drinks out of someone else's Coke can, and then this third one is this distraction and focus. Remember me throwing the bola, and of course I'm distracted, and I think it's not gonna affect anything, but the bola doesn't go quite right. And as a result, I end up with this smashed window. And I'm kind of convinced that in our life, the biggest error that we make is that we're distracted by all kinds of things that aren't the most important things. And then this last one is such a tricky one, which is that timing matters. And it's not that I was in control of the timing of doing this at the time that I kind of probably knew that my parents came home. But it turns out Bill Gross has probably made a hundred investments in many of the startups that you all know. He did a study of startups. And in it, he studied the hundred startups that he'd invested in and then a hundred startups that he didn't invest in that did very well or that failed. And he learned from it because he was curious as to what the number one reason was that they failed. And the number one reason they failed was that they built something that nobody wanted. Think about that. The number one reason startups fail is that they build something that no one wants. And then the number one reason they succeed, you'd think for sure that it was team or funding. But it wasn't. It was timing. Timing was more important even than the team. In other words, if, if Uber had started two years before, it probably would have never succeeded. Or if it started two years later, it would have been too late. The timing matters more than anything else. And so as you think about the manufacturing process, I want you to keep these in mind. Because while they're problems, they're not what I believe to be the biggest problem of all. In fact, if we were to take the time, and I've, I've done this now with, with a number of companies, if we were to take the time and just walk through all the problems and the challenges that you have in your company, why things aren't succeeding, or even in the government, we would come out with a wall full of all of these different things. And one of the most powerful things I've learned to do is when you come up with something that's not working, you figure out, well, why isn't that working? And then you find another reason, and then you say, well, why isn't that working? And you find another reason, and you can trace these things back. In fact, usually, it takes five to seven answers to get to the thing that's really causing the problem. And what I've learned is that there's only two things. that every problem in your company or in your government comes down to just two things when you trace them all back. And the first one is talent. It's, it's having
playing or hiring B players instead of A players. See, there's only two ways to get dolphins to do flips. You either take the time to train and develop dolphins that can do flips, or you buy dolphins that can do flips. That's the only two ways. And most organizations don't do either. They don't do either because they don't want to take the time to develop. And they don't want to pay the money for the talent. And so they progress forward with too many B players. And then as a result, they get all of these problems. The second one is trickier. The second one is about culture. See, even if you have A players, if you don't have a culture that will support the A players and their ability to empower themselves and take risks, they will not succeed. In other words, you can get, you can pay, you can take the time to develop all the A players you want, but if you also don't build a culture that allows them to succeed, you will still get a mediocre result. And, and culture has many things to it, and it affects so many things. And there's internal culture, and there's external culture, and there are many, many pieces to it. But there are a few that matter far more than all the rest. In fact, if you were to really do a little comparison about a strong versus a weak culture, you, you could capture some of these things. You'd see in a strong culture you get extreme ownership. And in a weak culture, people don't really own the problems. They want to, they sort of blame other people for the problems. And you get team and individual measurements, not just individual measurements. And they're inspired, that's kind of obvious, but the mission and values are consistent, meaning everyone knows the mission and everyone knows the values and you get the same answer from everyone and what actually matters is important and you, you have heroes in the company, stories that people can remember about their great successes of people and they love the culture. You can know this, you can just ask people, do you love the culture here? You, they'll just tell you, you'll hear the answer and there's a pull of leadership meaning people do things and then other people want to do it rather than they get pushed into doing it. You get all these things. But what I've learned is that when you look at the culture and the talent, these two things that cause all of these problems, there's one that causes both of them. And, and the answer comes in this. Wherever you have mediocre players and a mediocre culture, you will have a mediocre leader. And it doesn't mean that the leader can't get better. And I know I'm saying that to an audience that's mostly made of leaders, and so now you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that might be me. And it doesn't mean that you can't learn it. It just means that you've got to understand that those are the two key variables. And that it requires maybe a change of how you've been doing things and how you've been thinking. And the focus and the time that you put into it now has to go back to talent and culture. Because the key to innovation is to create these safe and rewarding cultures for risk taking. That's it. See, if I put somebody on a cool new project on the company, and then they fail at that project, what usually happens to that person? I mean, usually not good things. They can get fired, they get moved to the side quietly, and then everyone else in the company watches that and doesn't want to do it, and doesn't want to take a risk. And you can move to a point where this is so pervasive that it becomes the problem, not in an organization, it's just there, 
And then the people that are using it are creating content and using content, but they don't create the content because the machine does. But there's a, the people, the employees of Facebook, watch the machine and then make tweaks to figure out how to make the machine better. Google is a machine. It's a search engine, and as you search in it, as you find things, when you look up, you know, red birds with yellow wings, and you look up the images, and then you pick on the red bird with yellow wings, and you teach Google, in a way, what's a red bird with a yellow wing? And it gets better and better at that, and so it's a machine that keeps getting better on its own, and then all the employees of Google watch the machine, and they try to make the machine better. Uber is a machine. There's human drivers, but it's, it's software. There's this software running. And then the employees of Uber, they don't drive the cars. They don't really talk to the drivers other than to get feedback. But they're trying to watch the machine so they can make the adjustments of the machine. Amazon is a machine. I mean, it feels like there's very little software other than ordering something on the site. And there's a lot of stuff, physical stuff, moving around. But the site keeps learning. When you type in men's shoes, and then you pick a men's shoe, and then you rate it, it's like adjusting. And so the machine keeps getting better. Tesla is a machine. Even though they build cars, you think they build cars, but they don't build cars. They design cars on computers. And then they buy robots that build cars. And designing things on computers is exponential. And robots are exponential. Which means Tesla is an exponential company. Everything is exponential. Everything is improving, doubling in its price performance every year. Which means it's hard to even imagine what the company will be like 20, 30 years from now. It'll be so different because all these parts are exponential. And they're made with this concept of a factory, of an assembly line. And there's so many millions of things that we could talk about, about how to improve the assembly line, but I believe that there's just one that really matters. And it's a bit of a tricky concept, but what I'll walk you through now is the most expensive assembly line in the world, by far. And I, I had the opportunity recently, too, to tour it. And Andre talked to you yesterday. We got to actually see it. And it's for this, this F-35, which is this new fighter. So wars are won by gaining air superiority. Once you gain air superiority, once you own the sky, any battle on the ground comes massively in the advantage of whoever owns the sky. And so air superiority wins battles. And this F-35 fighter, no kidding, they're like $100 million each. And the U.S. is going to buy like 2,600 of them. And I think even my pilot is thinking of getting some. But the expected cost of this is going to be $1.5 trillion over 55 years. It is the largest contract of any kind, military or otherwise, ever done anywhere in the world. And there's an assembly line, a manufacturing process to build them. And so you can imagine that they probably have gotten really good at this. And you'd be right. And, and it's actually a stunning process, and it's stunningly complex. Because the amazing thing I thought is that this would look a lot like a Tesla line, but that's actually not how they're built. These are built by hand. They're built by hand. And if you have any concept at all as to the scale of this, this plant, by the way, is no kidding. The plant itself is one mile long. A mile long. And they build these from little parts. And some of them get out contracted and they assemble this mostly by hand. Now, there's a lot of automation on the smaller parts, but on the bigger pieces, they slowly put this thing together and they move it down the line. And it's a plant, it's a manufacturing line, just like anything else. 
It just happens to be the most expensive one in the world. And so sure enough, at the final end comes something that looks a lot like a plane. And then there are a few automated processes that they have, like painting it, where some robots do that. But for the most part, it's an integration of systems and people. And out, out the end, you actually get something that looks a little bit like this. These are the robots actually putting on the stealth coating and the painting of it. But out the end, somebody gets in that thing flies away. So think how well you've got to do this. I mean, it's not like there's like a little test run or something. Somebody actually has to get in it the first time and fly it. There's no like wind tunnels to sort of check, hey, this is really working and everything. It just works. And so you get an extraordinary level of quality in the building of something incredibly expensive. And even though it's not automated the way we think, it doesn't matter because the thing that they've learned that they believe is the single most important element is this idea of what they call a digital thread. <laughs> See, normally when you build something, there's a bunch of software that's working on trying to get all of the parts and the pieces there in the factory in the right place. And then there's a design, a three-dimensional model of what it is that it's supposed to look like when it's done. And then there are a bunch of processes and workflows that happen in order to take the parts and put them together so that it ends up looking like the design. And so if I want to make a change, if I decide that, you know, this little part, say, we're going to change this, and now it's going to, be, it's going to cause a little bump to stick out right here. If we're going to do that, imagine the cost of the change. And you'd just be staggering the reverberating secondary, tertiary, quadruciary impacts and effects of that. And so you would think that there's no innovation. Because if you came and said, oh, I have this great idea, we're gonna totally, I can totally, if we like move this thing back here, the radar will be able to pick up a little bit more. You'll get like 10 or 20 degrees more visibility. The impact of it would be so great that we would never do it. But they have this concept of what they call a digital thread. And the digital thread basically means that not only do I have a model of the plane, but I have a model of the factory line itself. Not just the factory line, but the actual plane moving down the line. In other words, as it's built, I'm scanning the plane so that I know like, that this part just got put on. And so now I see it in the model. It's one of the capabilities. The digital thread is the data allowing me to fuse all that together. But as a result of having all of the data now together, I actually have a virtual model of the factory line. Which means that if somebody comes up with an idea and says, well, I was thinking we could just you know, move this landing gear and tilt it just a little bit differently and maybe it would absorb you know, a harder landing. We don't have to change the whole factory line. We can just do it in the software first. In other words, you're converting your factory line back into software, into the model. And the power of this is it means that any person, you empower suddenly anyone in the process to experiment with anything. I mean, if I got responsibility to put the bolt on here and I think, well, let's just do five bolts instead of seven, I can now see and understand the cost of doing that. Because I've got a model, a software model of the entire line. I can do it in the software before I actually do it in the reality. And it's, it's an extraordinary thing, this digital thread. And my very strong belief is that you want to move towards a digital thread. 
because the digital thread buys you the ability now to innovate at very low cost. So the digital thread empowers anyone to explore and experiment and take risks. Because literally, you just pull the data down that you need and, just, and start looking at something in the virtual world. And then if it works out, you can go back and actually do it in the real physical world. I want to cover one other point. And it's really about success on factory mines. And, and it'll be a little painful. And what I want to talk about a little bit is, is the success of the carriage. So we built these carriages, which were drawn by horses, and it was incredibly successful, because it was a heck of a lot easier than someone on a course actually trying to carry something. And so slowly we moved away from horses into carriages. They were incredibly popular. In fact, they were so popular that we ended up with the success of carriages being the primary problem. What do I mean? Well, New York City began to be filled with manure. I mean, there was so much manure that it was the number one problem of the entire city. I mean, there were just so many carriages. The technology of the carriage had become so successful that we ended up with a new problem, which was the manure. And so literally, the manure started to build up, and we tried some solutions where we started to build these electric cars and you know you can still see them in San Francisco if you visit there's like the remnants of it and we tried to do it but but the manure kept building up I mean I mean really kept building up I was feet of manure and it got so bad that you couldn't even move the vehicles anymore And this, this wasn't just New York City. I mean, London had the same thing. In 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. And the issue that I'm getting at is one of abundance, is one of success. And it goes back to the things I was talking about earlier, about thinking things through all the way and, and dealing with the issues as you go. Because the solution to the problem, as we all know it, was this thing, this thing was sitting there, this car. And it's the, it's the one car in the photo. And this photo is 1900, by the way. Cars were designed 30 years before that. We had cars for 30 years, but they weren't popular. And they weren't popular because cars were like $1,000. $1,000 in 1900 would buy you about $5 million of land. I mean, only the richest people in the world had cars. And so eventually, obviously the success, in fact, this is actually the, one of the very first car. It was really created by a woman, except women weren't allowed the patents, and so her boyfriend had to sort of like get the patents. But this problem of abundance, creating a new problem, will not go away. And so as you think about the success, you also have to think about the new problem that you'll get from the success because they always come together. And now we have that same problem today. And it's not just in Thailand, it's everywhere in the world, where we've become so successful at engines and so successful at power plants that we have so many of them that we are getting a new problem. And we're starting to think through some of the issues and the problems, but we haven't done it all yet. I mean, I know we all know about the global warming coming, but the problems are quite severe, and Thailand is no exception to it. And if you looked at these pollution levels, they're, they're severe. It's like every person is smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And so if you want to think it through, it's not that we end up polluting the air more, it's that we end up with extraordinary health care costs 30 years from now. Health care costs that you can't back up, you can't back up 30 years and change it, you've got to like 
fix these things. Uh, recently, I went to Australia to the Great Barrier Reef, and I scuba dived the Great Barrier Reef. And it looks like this. I mean, all the coral was bleached. And I was in the most popular spot of the Great Barrier Reef. Because the year before, because of CO2 in the air, 90% of the Great Barrier Reef got bleached. One third of the Great Barrier Reef died in 2016. It's 800 miles long, one third of it died. And there were people on my boat that had photos of the coral just three or four years ago, and it was beautiful and colored. And it had changed because of our success. A year before, I went to Hawaii. And I visited the beaches in Hawaii. And I don't know if you've been to the beaches in Hawaii lately. But if you go to a beach that's not cleaned up by the hotel, they're covered in plastic. And stunningly, none of it is from Hawaii. See, we live in this world. This is all the water in the world. It's all the oceans, all the lakes, all the ice, all put in. It's this little bubble. We live inside of the bubble. It's the same bubble. And that's all the air in the world. In other words, the world is like, it's like a, a fishbowl. I mean, we didn't know that when we started to explore lands and continents, but we live in a fishbowl. And what it means is that everything we do that is not perfectly circular, we are poisoning our own fishbowl. And so we got to think things through. And we used to think that this fishbowl was just so big that it wouldn't matter, but we were wrong. We were wrong. The fishbowl is small. Because it's not even, this isn't the, this isn't, the, this isn't the bowl. The bowl is this tiny, tiny, thin little layer, and the rest is a giant rock. And so our little fishbowl is much, much smaller than we think. And even with the rock, I mean, it used to be, if I wanted to come here from California, I mean, it would have taken me a couple years. And I probably wouldn't have made it. But today I got here in 10 hours. And so our world, just in the last hundred years, shrank from being years big to being a day big. And so we live in a day big world. And if you think about levels of leadership, you know, we associate ourselves with these levels where, you know, you just end up managing crisis, which is kind of the lowest level of leadership. But as they get better, they manage the relationships to manage the crises. And then they start organizing. They become more of a manager. And then they realize that really they become an influencer because they need to influence other people at the same level or the people above them. And then they start to integrate. And they start to become a mentor where they train other leaders to become other leaders. But at the highest level, they start to think about this service to humanity. They get this long-term perspective and they start to think about future generations. And all of the best leaders in the world think this way. They extend the timeline of their thinking. And so as they build their manufacturing processes, they think it through, not for the next year or two, but they think it through for their children and their children's children. And the challenge is in this idea of abundance, because abundance is often a solution, but it's also always a new problem. And we usually only think about the solution, not the new problem. And I, I want to congratulate you here, because I know now that you recently created the Benefit Corporation. And if you remember, in a normal corporation, a normal corporation, the CEO, has a fiduciary responsibility to increase shareholder value. Meaning, if I do something as CEO, like let's say I pollute less, and it doesn't raise shareholder value, I could actually get sued as the CEO. But in a benefit corporation, I can't. That's the main difference. It's still a for-profit corporation, but now it allows me to do the right thing. 
And my very strong belief is that there's no more room in the world for purely for-profit corporations. Every corporation in the world, in my opinion, should quickly and soon become a benefit corp. Because we all care about the same thing. Everybody wants a world where we all continue to get to do business. It's just we also make the right decision. And today, we actually can't do that legally. I want to go back to this concept of risk and taking it. Because there's one chart, I think, that captures it. And it captures why we don't take the risks that we need to and why we don't do the things that we should and why we aren't always responsible. But it's like this. If you think about confidence, confidence is like whether I think I can do something or not. Competence is whether I actually can do something or not. They're different. They're two different things. But where you end up on this chart ends up mattering a lot in all of the decisions that you make. It impacts everything. And so if you're confident, so imagine you're a, you're a surgeon. You're a surgeon, and so you have the competence. You know that you can, you've learned to do that particular surgery. And you have the confidence, meaning you think you can do the surgery. Well, that's a great place to be. It's a great place of success, because you'll do the surgery, and you're going to do a good job at it. But there's another category on here, too, which is this one, where I don't really know how to do that particular surgery because I didn't learn it say. Maybe I'm a kidney doctor and someone needs surgery on their eye. So I don't know how to do it. And my confidence, too, is low. And that's actually a safe category also to be in. So I know I need help in order to do it. But let's look at some other ones. Because what happens if I actually know how to do the surgery, but I don't think I do? I'm not confident about it. What happens here? Because what we know what happens here is that we don't do anything. Isn't that weird? In other words, you know how to do it, but you don't really, you're not confident that you can. And so you, there's inaction. You won't, you won't do anything. And that's actually what we often associate with this concept of fear. And it immobilizes us. And it's not because we're humans. It immobilizes us in the deepest parts of our reptilian brain. And, and just to prove that to you, and it's only because I always show a cat video in my talks, I'll show you this cat video. And it's not, by the way, because I like cats. I actually kind of prefer dogs. But here we go. Watch this cat. going to get immobilized in the fear. It knows it's dealing with something that might be kind of dangerous or tricky. But this other lizard's going to catch it off guard. And it's not paying attention because it's so focused on its fear. Hi, Maggie. 
You're not meant for webcasting, are you? Just not a, not a cast kitty. Just not a... Look at her. She was going to... <laughs> she's... Look at her. She's challenging Nogi. Oh my gosh. Baggy. You will lose. <laughs> Look. Oh my gosh. She's staring her down. Baggy is not taking any guff from Noe. What? <laughs> Baggy! Baggy, abort! <laughs> There's nothing to be gained, Baggy! Baggy! Will you stop? Baggy, what are you doing? That is unnecessary. That is unnecessary, Baggy. That's, you know, I don't think that you understand. There's like this perspective, and then there's this perspective. What is that difference? I mean, think of the image that this cat, that little cat has of itself. And, and because the image it has of itself, it completely changes how it acts and how it responds. And the other cat is so afraid of, of just the lizard because it has a, a different self-concept. And, and this identity ends up being critical, not just for individual leaders, but for organizations and companies. Because in a world where disruption becomes a norm and change is dynamic, you have to learn how to do new things. You can't afford to not learn to do them. But even if you're told that, you still often won't do it. And we won't do it because we're afraid. And we're afraid because of the identity that we have. The world and the environment isn't going to change. The change that we have to make is actually to ourselves and to our own organizations. And we do that through the mindset and the culture of that change. But let's do this last block. What if you're the surgeon it's really confident you can do the surgery, but you don't have a clue how to do it. I mean, this is the category where all big mistakes happen. And so we avoid these with the highest amounts of effort. And so you can see in this table where you think you want to end up, and, and you're okay here, and you're okay there, and here you're basically not going to do anything, which now you also know, by the way, is also your death, not doing anything in a world that keeps changing. And it seems so much like we want to make sure, too, that we don't want to be certainly in that top category. So I'm going to show you a picture next, and I want you to imagine yourself in the picture and think about which category you're in in terms of competence and your confidence, okay? There's a real photo. Now where is that guy? I'm pretty sure he's in that top right corner. And I'm pretty sure I'm like way down here. And I'm gonna guess most of you are in that same thing. And so it's this, this area, this chart shows us a flow. But I'm gonna walk you through something just so you can get it because then you'll understand where all of this actually comes from. Uh, Mount Everest is not too far from here, and I've kind of gotten interested in this whole mountain climbing thing. 29,000 feet. It's actually minus 80 degrees, parts of Everest. By the way, minus 60 degrees, your skin freezes in one second. And so there's parts of Everest that's actually minus 80. And Everest actually is in a part of the wind, the jet stream, that allows it to actually get 200 mile per hour winds. And, except for a couple times a year, May and in November. Now the very sad and brutal thing is that there's still 200 dead bodies on Everest. In fact, they just did a thing where they took down six of the bodies. Because it takes a 12 person team to bring a body down. I mean, it seems like the people who have climbed Everest, they, they climb it once, they never do it again, but that's not actually true. In fact, Akka Sherma, 
Aqua has climbed Everest, not once, but he's actually climbed Everest 21 times. And maybe we look at Aqua and we think, well, Aqua's a superhero. And maybe that's true. And some of you, I guess, are probably thinking, well, I'm probably too old to climb Everest. Well, this is interesting because Yuchiro Mira climbed Everest when he was 80 years old. In fact, that was the seventh time he climbed Everest. And the first was when he was like 50. So if you think you're too old, I think you can scrap that one. And maybe you think, well, I'm going to fall. And people do fall down Everest. In fact, Yuchiramura definitely fell down Everest. And the amazing thing is that he fell when he fell. He fell, and then he landed on some snow that was kind of at an edge, but he actually fell, no kidding, 1,320 feet. So if you don't know what that looks like, it's actually higher than the financial tower in Hong Kong. And he fell that far, and he lived, and he walked away from it. Laughing, I heard. Now some of you are thinking, well, I'm, I'm not too old to climb numbers, I'm, I'm too young. <laughs> Well, Malavaf Porna climbed Everest, and she summited when she was 13. So all those younger than 13, you can raise your hand. And maybe some of the younger folks in here think, well, I don't have the money. I know it's really expensive to climb that Everest, but Malavaf also didn't have enough money. In fact, Malavaf and her parents together made 562 euro a year. And she managed to get some sponsors that helped her to climb Everest. Now I imagine that most of you are thinking, well, I'm just not strong enough to climb Everest. So, don't know if you know Mark Inglis or not, but Mark has no legs and climbed Everest. In fact, he broke one of his legs and had to get another one sent up so that he could replace it and keep climbing. So I was curious about this, and I was thinking at the time, I was in, uh, in uh, Italy, and I was thinking I wanted to give a talk about Everest. And so I, uh, I had a, a friend who was there with me at the time. His name is James Clark. He went to business school with me. In fact, he's the CEO of QBC of China. I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing a talk about climbing Everest. He said, oh yeah, you know, I did that years ago, been there, done that. I was like, what? He's like, oh yeah, yeah, right after business school, I went ahead and I like climbed Everest. So I didn't believe him. And so sure enough, when I went home that night, I looked it up. And you can look up on a website everyone who climbed Everest. And sure enough, he climbed and summited Everest. And he never said a word to me about it. So the next day, I come back, and we're actually at the summit, another Singularity Summit, and I'm sitting next to Paul Neal, and I'm telling him this story about how this guy I've known my whole life had climbed Everest and never even mentioned it. And Paul turns to me, and he says, oh yeah, I did that two years ago. <laughs> I was like, you, you did what? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I climbed Everest a couple years ago. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. He's like, no, no, it actually it wasn't too bad. So I went home, and of course I didn't believe him, and I looked him up, and sure enough, in 2013, he summer did Everest. But it was better than that. 24 hours later, he then summited the next highest peak, the fourth highest peak in the world, Lhotse. Within a day, he summited Everest, and then it's like, I guess he wasn't tired enough or something, and then he decided he'd do another one. In fact, when I looked at his record, it turned out that he'd actually summited all seven of the highest mountains on every continent. I just came from Denmark because I'm participating in a singularity program we had there. And there's this, this guy named Moens Jensen. He's a Dane. And I learned that Moens, no kidding, lives in Denmark and then jogged and rode his bicycle to Everest. And then when 
he got there, 11,500 kilometers, 13 countries, which he covered in just 100 days. And then he tried to climb Everest. And no kidding, he tries to do it without oxygen. And he's an asthmatic. <laughs> and he makes it almost all the way to the top. He turns around 350 meters from the top. He can see the top. And he turns around. So next year, he jogs and rides his bike back to Everest. <laughs> And he does even worse. He only gets like 848 meters, even worse, and goes home. But he returns in 2007, and he summits. Fall seven times, stand up eight. Moen Jensen's favorite phrase. See, the truth is that any of you can climb Everest, but you don't believe it because you haven't researched it enough. When you climb Everest today, it's roped the entire way. There's ropes you hook in and you walk, and as long as you keep walking, and you don't happen to be maybe the small percentage of people that get you know, pulmonary or cerebral edema from the altitude sickness. I mean, you just keep walking and you can get to the top of Everest. I mean, there's, there's more people that climbed Everest, I mean, in a year, than all the people that, like, climbed Everest for, like, 30 years. There's so many people climbing Everest, there's actually traffic jams on Everest. <laughs> and, and the very strange thing is, that it's all made possible because of one exponential technology. Anybody know what it is? One exponential technology will enable any of you to climb Everest. Strangest thing. Super computing. Because of supercomputers, we're so good at predicting the weather that we can tell you exactly when is the right time to climb Everest. So you'll be able to walk up Everest on a sunny day all the way up, which is the main reason that people used to die on Everest. But now it'll just be a hike up a seven mile high mountain. See, you think about this category again, about what you actually can do and how confident you are about it. And this, this category, this red category especially, is where you have this high confidence and you have this low confidence. And it seems like such a dangerous place. In this place, even worse, where you actually can do it, but you don't think you can? And yet if you really looked at the chart, you'd find that the giant opportunities are in that space. And this space of inaction is purely yourself not doing it. And the changes that you make in the manufacturing or in your companies or in your governments will occur only because of these two things. Either you really won't know how to do it and you need to learn, or you really already can just do it, which it turns out is almost everything today. There's very few things you can't learn to do, including climbing Everest. But you will never do it if you don't think you can. It's really quite stunning. I, I talked to James Clark uh, last November, this is past November. And he told me that after he climbed Everest, he climbed K2. Now, I don't know if you know about K2. Everest, about 1 in 20 people still die, actually, climbing Everest. And they usually die because they don't take 
enough gear with them and they try and do really crazy. I mean, people who die on Everest are actually usually doing kind of crazy things and it keeps that number high. But K2, one in four people die. One in four die. And I was really impressed. I was like, wow, that's just incredible, James. And he's like, yeah, but I really don't think it was very much because, you know, a month later, this other guy climbed it and then just skied down the whole thing. <laughs> skied down K2. All the way, top to bottom, you can actually get online and, and watch different parts of it. In other words, K2 was nothing to him. See, fear keeps us focused on the past, worry about the future. It, it creates an inaction in us to change. If we can acknowledge our fear, we can realize that right now we're okay. It's a beautiful quote. Right now, today, we're still alive. Our bodies are working marvelously. Our eyes can still see the beautiful sky. Our ears can still hear the voices of our loved ones. Meaning, if you're alive, you can do anything. If you wake up, and you're not six feet under the ground, you can pretty much do anything that you want. Because in a world of information, all of the skill to learn to do anything, whether it's digital threads in manufacturing loops or changing the pollution of a nation, you can do it. I'll tell and close with one last story. Anna. For the longest time, I just didn't get the story. But now I get it, and I'll tell you the story, and I recognize that you might not get it at the end. And even if that's true, I'm, it'll be a little unsettling, but I want you to recognize that I'm, I'm not going to explain it, because I know that as time passes, you'll get it. And it's a story about dealing with the future and dealing with the past and the worry of the past and the errors and the dangers of the future. And in the story, I believe, is the essence of eliminating all of that fear. And the story, I learned it, I was in uh, Japan, and it was from a, a guy, a wonderful human being uh, in Japan, who had actually spent a lot of time studying uh, samurai warriors in Japan. He's got two or three hundred of their swords and just a fascination with it. And he said, the last samurai, and it's just a story, but he said the last samurai was being chased by a bear. And he's worried about the bear. And so as he's running in, in fear, the bear, he realizes that he's approaching a cliff. And so he's worried about the cliff. But he has no choice. He has to choose between jumping off the cliff or being mauled by the bear. And so sure enough, he decides he's going to jump off of the cliff. And he jumps off of the cliff. And as he falls down the cliff, he ends up hitting a branch. And he's stuck on this branch. And he looks up and he can see the bear growling above him. And he looks down to jump, but there's a tiger underneath him. And the tiger is growling and leaping, trying to get him. And as he's sitting there, the branch actually starts to break. And on the branch is a vine with some strawberries on it. And he reaches out and picks a strawberry and puts it in his mouth says, ah, delicious. Totally my pleasure to be with you here today.